Talk Show. Recorded live. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. This is Rod. All right. Uh, the prior episodes dealt with the IT&J ceremony of coming into force and effect. It's going to take us to push the issue. Technically, you and I are going to be the enforcement on all this stuff. Let me bring up to you what was filed into the appeals court and how it was sit down and laid out. So you guys have have an ideal here. Uh, The brief itself gets in and lays out the complaint. Question for equitable relief. This is in section four. Section one, two, you know, you, you got the, the first one is the cover page. The second one is the certificate of interest parties, where you live, who you are, who you're dealing with. Third page is table context. Fourth one is question for equitable relief. This accused party comes before the United States Court of Appeals and respectfully requests a hearing on a Second Amendment violation of the District of Columbia's Capitol Hill Police in violation of the District of Columbia's codes, as well as the federal regulations pertaining to the right to carry or carry with a concealed permit or license from any of the 50 states with the right to possess small arms. Now listen to the words here. Small arms handgun and or rifle or firearms. So now we're coming back in and we are making a distinction between small arms, a handgun and a rifle or a firearm. So you're going to have to sit down and say, okay, you're allowed to bring pistols in, you're allowed to bring rifles in. Now you're also are allowed to bring in firearms, which means you're allowed to bring in machine guns. You're allowed to have sawed-off shotguns. You're allowed to have sawed-off rifles. And you are allowed to have silencers because that's the definition of the word firearm. Not small arms, not handguns, not rifles. Okay, now let me come back in. Possess small arms, handguns, and or rifles, or firearms within the 10 mile square of the District of Columbia, which includes on any and all property which is not posted, restricted, or prohibited of small arms or firearms within the 10 mile square or where a party may be just passing through that 10 mile square. This is relief that we're asking for. Number five, table of context. June 23rd, 2014, Palmer versus District of Columbia. New case law upheld that the DC gun ban was unconstitutional for the third time. Heller versus District of Columbia. McDonald versus Chicago were the first and second case that defined the D.C. gun ban as unconstitutional by Supreme Court decisions. Crawford versus Washington, 541 U.S.C. 36, 2004. In all criminal pros- prosecutions, the accused shall enjoy the right to be confronted with the witnesses against him. Now, we're putting in case law. There's a reason for that, because we're giving the answers to questions that's going to be asked later. We're already counting what the answers are. 
Rockford versus Washington deals with the corpus delicti. In all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall enjoy the right to be confronted with the witnesses against him. Pellet versus Rode, Rose, 496 U.S.C. 356, 1990, federal law and Supreme Court cases apply to state court cases. So now we're coming back in and says, hey, your law, your rule sits here and says you have to comply with Supreme Court decisions. It isn't an option. Your own rule says you have to. Bond versus United States is a decision by the Supreme Court of the United States that individuals, not just states, may have standing to raise Tenth Amendment challenges to federal law. Tenth Amendment. Anything that is not given to the United States or to the state is reserved to you and I. You and I have last say. And you know what Miranda versus Arizona means? All right, now we're coming in with the Constitution and Bill of Rights and amendments. Now, you notice that I've made distinctions between Constitution, Bill of Rights, and amendments. Now, these are my, these are my authorities. These are my table of, of citations. These are my case laws. These are my table of authorities. Article 4 of the Constitution was to give full faith and credit. You know what Section 1 and 2 is? 14th Amendment, Section 1, equal protection under the law. The amendment under the 4th, the right of the people to be secure in their persons, homes, property, and effects against unreasonable search and seizure. You, are, you already know what the 4th Amendment is. You know what the 5th Amendment is. You also know what the 6th Amendment is. Federal regulations. Regulations under Title 42, 1981. Equal protection under the law. Statement of equal rights. All persons within the jurisdiction of the United States shall have the same rights in every state and territory to make and enforce contracts, to sue, be party, give evidence, and to have full and equal benefit of all laws and proceedings for the security of persons and property as enjoyed by white citizens and shall be subject to like punishment, pain, penalties, taxes, license, and extractions of every kind and to no other. Title 42, 1981 gives everybody the same freedom, no matter whether you're in North Carolina or whether you are in D.C., and we're going to get into some of that because we're going to bring up some walls here on that. Title 42, 1983. You know what this is? IRS regulations, 26, section 5845, firearms. Now, this is why in section 4 we made a distinction between small arms and the word firearm. The word firearm is, I already repeated this to you people, sawed-off shotgun, sawed-off rifle, fully automatic machine gun, and a silencer. ATF regulation, Title 27, 479.11. Again, it goes in and lays everything out. Congressional Acts, etc., under Statutes at Large, 1902 Dick Act. National Firearms Act, 1934. 1968 Gun Control Act. Firearms Owner Protection Act, 1986, Firearms Protection Act, 1996. All this defines what firearms are by legal definition. Treaties agreed to by the United States, the Geneva Convention. A6, Defense of Self and Patients Under Care. A. Protected personnel are, one, authorized to be armed with individual small arms. Army Regulations 71-32 provides a document that governs what type of small arms medical personnel 
are authorized, limited to pistols or rifles, or authorized substitutes. Ladies and gentlemen, under treaties, under Army regulation, it defines the difference between small arms and firearms. This is what we threw into the district court for the appeal side. This is what they're looking at. Statement six. Statement of jurisdiction. Jurisdiction of this court is invoked under section 1291. Title 28 USC code on appeal from final judgment of conviction and sentence in the United States District Court for the name of the court notice of appeal was timely filed in accordance to Rule 4B of the Federal Rules of Appellate Procedure. We have the case number down here. Number seven. Now listen closely to number seven, because remember, I gave you the answers in number five. Here's your case law. Here's your answers. This is what you're supposed to go by. These were your decisions. This is what you sit here and said are the rules. Good. Let's go by these rules. I'm giving you the answers. Now I'm going to ask the question. Issue one, whether in any civil or criminal complaint can a statute be used as a corpus stelecti when the Supreme Court has ruled that the charging statute is unconstitutional or constitutional. Can a statute be used? Now, let's go back up to Section 5. And what did we sit here and read in Section 5 on Crawford versus Washington? In all criminal prosecution, the accused shall enjoy the right to confront with the witnesses against him. How can I confront a statute, especially one that's been declared unconstitutional? Think about what we got laid out here, ladies and gentlemen. Think about what we are saying. I gave the answers at the top. Now we're going to come down and ask the question. And what was that question? That question was, in any civil or criminal complaint, can a statute be used as a corpus stelecti? When the Supreme Court has ruled that that charging statute is unconstitutional or constitutional. We're coming in asking them a question. Can a statute be used as a corpus delecti? Remember what Kessler told me when I asked about the corpus delecti? Well, Mr. Klaas, you broke the law. And what did I ask her? Do you really want to tell me that? Because I proceeded to explain the criminality of her prosecution of what statute they broke. So now we're coming back in and we're asking the appeals court, can a statute be a corpus delecti? Can a statute, something is written, can it be harmed? Can it be the injured party? How can I confront a statute? Think about it. Issue two, whether the ruling of the District of Columbia gun ban as unconstitutional applies to the whole 10 mile square of the District of Columbia when there are no warning signs posting restrictions or prohibited a firearm in these areas. If they don't have it posted and they don't warn you, That becomes an issue. Rather than ruling of the district claiming gun ban as unconstitutional applies to the whole 10 mile square of the District of Columbia, does it apply to the whole area when there are no warning signs?
posting restrictions or prohibitive of firearms in these areas. Because they tried to get me for being on federal property. Well, it's all federal property. But now we're coming back in. If you don't put a sign up, you don't warn me, and your gun laws are unconstitutional, can you still charge me for having on a property that's not posted whenever your Supreme Court has ruled your laws are unconstitutional? That's issue number two before. Issue number three, a physical disabled citizen with a carry concealed permit or without a carry permit from another state comes into the District of Columbia. Are they afforded the same equal protection by the Americans with Disabilities Act amendments of 1990, Section 504, which is the ADAAA, and the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, Title VII, Section 504, and under the Article IV, Section 1 and 2 of the Constitution, and the 14th Amendment, Section 1, and as found in the federal regulations, Title 42, 1981, equal protection under law to pose, to possess a handgun and or a rifle within the 10-mile square of the District of Columbia, or if they are just passing through the District of Columbia. Under the Disabilities Act, you have a right to self-defense. Under the Disability Act, D.C. is collecting federal funding. So can they sit here and violate the Federal Funding Act of self-protection under the Disability Act? Think about what we're asking in the appeals court, and you wonder why this is not before three judges. Issue number four. Rather, when small arms, pistol, and our rifle are locked up and secure inside of an automobile, pickup truck, an SUV, Jeep, or an RV, and the owner of the vehicles has a carry concealed permit or does not have a permit from another state, does this still not constitute constitutionality protected rights of the Second Amendment? and to the right of self-defense while in the 10-mile square or just passing through that 10-mile square. You understand why we're why we are going after the 10-mile square area? Think about what we're sitting here doing. Number five, rather the filing of a defendant's paperwork into their own court case can be denied when the court has ordered the public defender's office to file the defendant's court filings for them, which the public defender's office has refused to do, does this not constitute due process violations and constitutional contempt upon the public defender's office and a breach of duty under the rules of ethics of fairness? These are the five issues that was put before the appeals court. Think about what these issues, what we are talking about. Think about what we put before them. Is that we're coming in and asking them, can a statute be a corpus delicti? Can an unconstitutional gun ban was not posted in the District of Columbia, can we be charged? We're talking about the Disability Act and Rehabilitation Act and Article 4, Section 1 of Equal Protection from State to State, 14th Amendment, Equal Protection, Title 42, Equal Protection. Think about what we're asking here. These are the questions that is put before the appeals court. Their decision 
deals with the statutory side of this thing, because if they come back and say, yes, statutes most certainly can be used as a corpus delecti, they hung their self because they breached their own rules and regulations, which is what I pointed out before Wilkins and Kessler and Roberts. If they come back and say, no, statutes can't be used as a corpus delecti, then that means everybody who's sitting in jail has to have their case reheard. Think about the implication that's being brought out here. I didn't make these rules up, they did. I gave you the case laws that went back and defined these different issues. I gave them the answer before I asked the question. I gave them an open book test. I'm going to test you. Here's your answers. Read over your answers. Now, here's the questions. I want you to answer the questions with the answers that I gave above. Ladies and gentlemen, this is why this is sitting before all these judges. Introduction of the case. On or about May 30th, 2013, this accused party entered the 10-mile square of the District of Columbia in his Jeep to file congressional documents before the House and the Senate Committee of the Judiciary. The accused is required to walk through two metal detectors, one in the House of Representatives and the other being in the Senate building. While the accused was in the congressional buildings, the Capitol Hill Police surrounded and taped off an area around the accused Jeep as a crime scene area. After leaving the Senate building, the accused party approached the area to his Jeep to be stopped by Capitol Hill Police to have his keys taken and to be handcuffed and to be placed in the back seat of a Capitol Hill cruiser, at which time Capitol Hill Police asked if they could search the Jeep. The accused party asked if they had a warrant. Remember what we talked about on the Fourth Amendment? Got to have a warrant. Capitol Hill Police Party, they did not have a warrant at the time. At which point, Capitol Hill Police then inquired if there was any firearms in the Jeep. They were informed that no such items were in the Jeep. However, the accused did possess a carry concealed permit from North Carolina for a handgun and a rifle that is inside the Jeep. I had permit for small arms. At that point, the Jeep was being searched and the accused party was interrogated for approximately an hour out on the street and it was taken down to the station, interrogated again by federal marshals, the FBI, and unknown other federal agency personnel for approximately three hours. The accused party was then told he was under arrest and was then finally read his Miranda rights all after the fact of previous detention, interrogation, and placed in jail. You do understand what the Miranda versus Arizona is, right? They have to read you this before they do anything. And they did all this before they read me my rights. Statement of the case. Nature of the case. The accused party was charged for having a firearm within the District of Columbia and on Capitol Hill grounds on May 30th, 2013, when on October 26, 2014, a new indictment superseding the old charges and reduced the charges to just one charge of only having a firearm on Capitol Hill ground. Statement of the fact, the accused party was given a public defender named A.J. Kramer for the Federal Public Defender's Office to assist him in his defense. The accused party explained to A.J. Kramer the errors of the Capitol Hill Police on the failure to read him his rights First, before questioning the accused, the accused party also informed Mr. Kramer of his working knowledge of the law and research. The accused party also informed Mr. Kramer of going before the first grand jury and explained to the grand jury of having a carry concealed permit from North Carolina and how they, the grand jury, were misinformed on the implication of the Heller case. The prosecutor told the grand jury they only had one decision to decide. Did I, the defendant, have firearms within the District of Columbia and Capitol Hill grounds? The 
prosecutor knew that he was misleading the grand jury by the way he was manipulating the status of decisions question the grand jury had to make a decision the accused party had several status hearings in, two, in which Mr. Kramer and the public defender did not put up a defense. This accused party, after about the third time or the fourth status hearing, requested that he be allowed to file in his own case, as Mr. Kramer was not addressing any discernible defense, issuing pursuant to regulations under Rule 12 of the Criminal Rules of Procedure. Judge Kessler stated and granted the accused party would be allowed to file into his own defense and that the accused party was required to know the court rules. Mr. Kramer would be standby counsel and not counsel. However, after the court began receiving filings from this accused party, at the next status hearing, the accused party was informed that all filing would go through Mr. Kramer, a public defender's office, and then into the court. Remember what we said up above it is the fact that he was, I was ordered to go through him and he was to file my paperwork and he did not. But given the answer, gave him the question, here's, here's the answers. The accused party presented Mr. Kramer with filing to be placed into the court on his behalf of the accused party, but Mr. Kramer refused to file any documents on behalf of this accused party, despite the court order that he was required to file the accused paperwork. The accused paperwork was forced to file a motion for interim appearance as a third party intervener in order to get his filings on or in the court record and on the docket sheet. As status saying, the accused party asked Judge Kessler, who was the corpus stelicti? As he wanted to know who was the injured party in this action. Judge Kessler responded was that the statute was the injured party. At that point, the accused party then proceeded to explain the statutory violation of the prosecution under their own rules of court, with the accused making a number of issues, such as procedural errors and violations. Judge Kessler then left the courtroom without promptly closing the court proceeding for that next day. The accused party stood in front of Judge Kessler at another status hearing and proceeded to show errors of the prosecutors and the court rules of evidence and pointed out the regulations of the Title 28, Section 2255 of constitutional vi violations and statutory violations as well as, for, as grounds for dismissal. This accused party also pointed out Article 4, Section 1 and 2, as well as the 14th Amendment, Section 1, Equal Protection Under the Law, Judge Kessler then asked the prosecutor if he was able to rebut any of the accused statements. The prosecutor refused to respond, at which point Judge Kessler left the courtroom again with promptly closing the court and never returning and presiding judge in this case. The next status hearing was before Judge Richard W. Roberts, at which point the accused reminded Judge Roberts that Judge Franklin Scully Jr., a judge under Judge Roberts' supervision, wrote in his July 24th ruling in Palmer v. D.C. that the right to bear arms extends outside the home, therefore gun control laws in the nation, capital, were unconstitutional. From about July 25th to 20, 2014, before the D.C. codes and laws were found it to be unconstitutional and due to the fact that the accused already had a carry concealed permit from North Carolina, then why was the case continuing against the accused? The accused also pointed out the Second Amendment right and other statutory issues to have this case dismissed. Judge Roberts then left the courtroom without properly closing the court for that day. The prosecution then requested a second secret from the accused and the public grand jury on or about October 24, 2014 to dismiss the DC firearm charge and the Capitol Hill charge and reinstate only the charge concerning the Capitol Hill ground to supersede the previous two charges. The accused party filed a number of documents 
estimating to be between 75 to 80, filed into the court on his case as a third-party intervener to address violations of the prosecution. These filings have been recorded on the docket sheet of the United States District Court for the District of Columbia, but have not been allowed to be part of the public record. Both Judge Kessler and Judge Roberts denied any court filings from the accused party on the grounds of failure to file for leave of court, fully knowing that Mr. Kramer would not file any of the court paperwork on behalf of this accused. This, this assured that all filings of the accused would be denied for failure to file for leave of court, which denied an affirmative defense to the Second Amendment gun case and denied due process and equal protection under the law. This action has now created constitutional contempt and due process violation, including violation of the Taft-Hartley Act of 1947 of running a closed union shop for bar members only. Of course, are aware that the two-party prosecution in the defendant lawyer in a courtroom belongs to the same union association membership cannot be in conflict with each other as they were trained under the same theory and concept of opinion, thereby creating the setup as a solidarity system under a union association membership instead of an adversarial system under the Constitution. 10. Issue of facts, errors, and judgment. The prosecution misled the grand jury. The prosecution misled the grand jury on many issues in the first grand jury hearing, as well as the second grand jury hearing. In the first grand jury hearing, the prosecution misled the grand jury to believe that the D.C. gun laws were invalid, even though the Supreme Court were valid, even though the Supreme Court upheld the Second Amendment right in the Heller v. D.C. and McDonald v. Chicago and in doing so had declared that the D.C. firearm laws were unconstitutional. In the second grand jury hearing, the prosecution failed to disclose that the Capitol Hill grounds, sitting within that same 10-mile square of the District of Columbia, a.k.a. Washington, D.C., the prosecution failed to disclose that the Capitol Hill grounds were required to be posted under federal regulations, in order to warn the public not to have any firearms or weapons on Capitol Hill grounds or property, purported in Regulation 18, Section 930H. Notice of provision of subsection A and B shall be posted conspicuously at each public entrance to each federal facility, and notice of subsection E shall be posted conspicuously at each public interest of each federal court facility, and no person shall be convicted of any offense under Section A or E with respect to the federal facility if such notices is not posted at such facilities, unless such person has actually notice of subsection A and E, as the case may be. Prosecution also willfully misled and failed to inform the grand jury that the D.C. gun codes were overturned and declared to be unconstitutional by two Supreme Court decisions. And the prosecution fairly misrepresented the following statement to the grand jury. The prosecution told the grand jury that the accused party had firearms and had failed to pay taxes on these firearms. When the accused party was in possession of small arms, two handguns and a rifle, which are by lawful definitions and not regulated, not firearms under ATF or IRS regulations or under the following Congressional Act, the National Firearms Act of 1934, 1968 Gun Control Act, or the Firearms Owner Protection Act of 1986 and 1996, and the Dick Act of 1902. He was not in any violations. The accused party was represented by the prosecution as knowingly and unlawfully carrying and having readily accessible a firearm on Capitol Hill grounds. The accused party at no time carried or possessed or had access to any small arms or firearms as defined in any statutes, the National Firearms Act of 1938, 68 Gun Control Act, 
Firearms Owner Protection Act, 1986, 1996, and 1902 DICIC on Capitol Hill grounds as they were locked up in the Jeep, and the D.C. police took possession of the Jeep by taping it off, thereby taking possession of the Jeep, and then stopping the accused party, thereby taking possession of the Jeep keys, and then arresting the accused party some 20 or more feet away from the Jeep. At no time was the accused witnessed by the Capitol Hill Police to be in possession of small arms or firearms. See the above. 12. First issue, Mr. Kramer. Breach, fulfilling discharge of his duties. A.J. Kramer breached his duty as the public defender to the accused party by failing to discharge his duty faithfully. The following topic was discussed as the defense with Mr. A.J. Kramer in his office in front of witnesses, and these issues were refused by that office as an affirmative defense on behalf of the accused party. Court rules under Criminal Rule 12 required a rebuttal of all charges for an appeal. Nothing was filed on behalf of the accused party by A.J. Kramer. Public Defender's Office was aware of the Heller case and the McDonald's case decision that declared the D.C. gun ban unconstitutional, and now with the Palmer versus the District Columbia decision, again stated that the D.C. gun ban is unconstitutional. A.J. Kramer should have used this defense, and he did not. Public Defender's Office is also aware that Capitol Hill grounds were required to be federally Public Defender's Office was also aware that the Capitol Hill ground was required by federal regulation to be posted with warning signs. The Public Defender's Office was also aware that the accused party did not have in his possession or access to any of the guns as the D.C. police took possession of the Jeep by taping the area around the Jeep and taking possession of the accused party's keys at the time, thus barring the accused party from entering a restricted area around the Jeep. The regulation of the term of firearm as defined in IRS and ATF regulates by Congress Acts, Congressional Acts of Congress under Gun Control Act. The Miranda warning was not given until four hours after the fact. There was no injured party. The accused party did have a North Carolina permit for carry concealed. Article 4 of the Constitution was to afford and give full faith and credit. 14th Amendment. Title 42, 1981. 13. Second issue, A.J. Kramer as public defender off an other breach of full faith discharge of his duty. The accused party was told by the court that all court bond was to be filed through Mr. Kramer and the public defender himself on behalf of the accused party. Mr. Kramer breached his duty by refusing to file any court filings on behalf of the accused party in violation of the court requiring him to file for the accused party. The accused party may place in as a defense to the above topic to have them denied by Mr. Kramer in violation of criminal rule 12 as a rebuttal to the allegation. The accused party was forced to file as a third party intervener into the case number 113CR253RWR because Mr. Kramer refused to follow court orders to file on behalf of the accused party. Mr. Kramer was aware that by failing to follow court orders, the accused party would be denied by the court for failure to get leave of court. The accused party has filed over 75 documents into case number 113CR254, RWR, as required under regulations of Rule 12, rebutting all allegations of the prosecution. Conclusion. The issues before the United States Court of Appeals are simple issues. Whereas there has been three Supreme Court decisions on the right to carry within the District of Columbia, being Heller versus the District of Columbia, McDonald versus the District of Columbia, and now Palmer versus the District of Columbia, which declared the District of Columbia gun laws unconstitutional for the third time. Now comes the issue, does these case laws, decisions, apply to the whole 10-mile square of the District of Columbia, whereas there are no signs posted or warnings to the public for restricted areas? 
Can a citizen from any of the 50 states with a carry concealed permit, whether just passing through the District of Columbia or stopping to do business within the 10 mile square of the District of Columbia, be afforded the same equal protection of these three Supreme Court decisions? Is a citizen with a physical disability under the American with Disabilities Act afford the same equal protection of the Second Amendment right with or without a carry concealed permit when they enter the 10 mile square of the District of Columbia, whether, whether they were just passing through or stopping to take care of business while they are there in the District of Columbia for these three Supreme Court decisions? Can an unconstitutional statute be used as a corpus delicti in order to charge a citizen for a crime when the same statutes have been ruled to be unconstitutional? Can the accused be denied due process of law when their defense lawyer has been ordered by the court to file the accused court filings but fails or refuses to file them because it becomes a conflict with the defense lawyer's theory, concept, and opinion of the obligation to the union association membership believing in relating to that of the natural law in Article 3, Section 2, and Article 4 under the Constitution for the United States of America and that the international treaty to which the courts are bound. Does this not become constitutional contempt and due process violations on the part of the public defender's office to the natural law of this nation, the Constitution, and also violate international law. The Geneva Convention is an international treaty of law and army regulations or congressional regulations under international treaty that defines pistols and rifles as small arms and by lawful definitions are not firearms. Is this not true? Section A, defense of Self and patients under care, protected personnel are authorized to be armed with any individual small arms. Army Regulation 71-32 provides a doctrine that governs what types of small arms medical personnel are authorized, limited to pistols or rifles, and authorized substitute. So we put the international law right back into them, and we shoved it in their face. Cure. From the Treaties of Suits and Chancery, Henry Gibson, 1902, second edition, setting forth the principal pleading practices, proof, and process of the jurisprudence of equity. Section 8, the divine law of justice, the rule of decision. The statement often made that the courts of chancery were established to migrate the rigors of the common law and to supply its defects is not wholly true. This court was established to do justice, regardless of any and all laws. The king deemed it a duty imposed upon his conscience, both by his oath and by religion, to decree justice, and to decree justice, he decreed himself bound rather to the divine law than to human law. And when the chancellor's act did in his stead, he based his decisions not upon the law of the land, but upon honesty, equity, and conscience. For so was he commanded to do and exercise the king's prerogative of grace. In short, the Chancery Court was established rather as a court based on the perception of religion than a court based on rules of law. It is unquestionably true that the harmless harshness of common law itself unfits to cope with fraud. It's incapable to do justice in many cases. The defects in its remedies, the, op the, uh, the optimists, it gives the strong to oppose the weak. And it's generally inadequate to meet the requirements of equity created contribute to pursuance of Extinction of the Chancery Court, excuse me, people, and to enlarge the justification and jurisdiction, nevertheless. But this is all in that Rule 8 of equity. 
Ladies and gentlemen, this is what is sitting before the appeals court. We are challenging, can a statute be a corpus delicti? Especially when it has been declared to be unlawful, unconstitutional, illegal. Can an illegal law be used to charge you with? If the property is not posted, and there's no warning signs, and you have a carry concealed permit, or your state gives you the right to carry openly, can you be charged when we are supposed to be one country? on what we are doing. We're supposed to have the same equal rights no matter where we go, no matter how we go. We are to have equal, equal protection. Let me read something to you here from the regulations of Title 42, Section 1983. Every person who under color of any statute, ordinance, regulations, customs, or usage of any state or territory or the District of Columbia subjects or causes to be subject any citizen of the United States or any persons within the jurisdiction thereof to the deprivation of any rights, privileges, or immunities secured by the Constitution and law shall be liable to the party injured in an action at law suit in equity or other proper proceedings for redress, except that in any action brought against a judicial officer for an act or admission taken in such officer's judicial capacity, injunction relief shall not be granted unless a declaratory decree was violated or declaratory relief was unavailable. For the purpose, now this is, this, listen to this, for the purpose of of this section, any act of Congress applicable excluding to the District of Columbia shall be considered to be the statute of the District of Columbia. For any act of Congress, unless it is excluded, the District of Columbia has to come in compliance, the 1902 DIC Act, National Firearms Act, 1934, 1968, Gun Control Act and Army regulations because this is the military area. They have to come in with the with in compliance with definitions of the words and full understanding. Ladies and gentlemen, this is what is sitting right now before the appeals court. And you wonder why maybe they are having a little problem. This is why, ladies and gentlemen, because we backed them into a corner. We've laid out international treaties to define small arms. We laid out congressional definitions of what a firearm is. These are two different things. We are addressing if they do not have it posted and there is no warning signs up, can they charge you if they do not notify you ahead of time? That's what your law says. you got to notify me. If you are disabled and you're not able to go 20 rounds in a knockdown, drag out fight, Under the Disability Act and Rehabilitation Act, are you not entitled to have something to defend yourself with because you are not able to go 20 rounds? Think about what we're asking here, ladies and gentlemen. Think about what we're putting into these people. We're coming back in and addressing that the public defender was told to file my paperwork and he refused. 
he refused to enter my paperwork. Rule 12 says I have the right to rebut. Ladies and gentlemen, this brings us up to why we're pushing the PAG side of this thing, the private attorney general, and why we're pushing the bounty hunter side. I made a recording here the other day. I want you people to think about what I'm going to sit down, what I'm going to tell you. I realize we have people out here and all they're trying to do is get by as long as they can get by. Let me off. Get me out of the system. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm not knocking it because if they can get you off, by all means, use it. Get yourself out. But I want you to think about this for a minute. I use this as an example. And it really fits. Because we're being raped by the court. We're being raped by the system. Put this in perspective of someone coming in and raping your wife and raping your daughter. As long as they pay for the services rendered which would be the restitution. And this is what a lot of these people are going for. As long as you can get my case dismissed, we're happy. So as long as you pay for the rape, which are basically you're paying for the prostitution, this, this makes it all right. What you're not considering here is the damage that was done to your wife, the damage that was done to your daughter, the mental anguish that was done, and it was a crime to start with to rape. The fact that you paid for services rendered doesn't make it okay. Because what you've done is you've allowed this rapist to go out to the next victim and keep raping the next victim. This is what the court system is doing to us. They may dismiss your case, but you were unlawfully detained, you were kidnapped, you lost time off of work, it cost you time to go in and fight these people. So even if you got your case dismissed, you were still damaged. You were still injured. You still had harm done to you. This is the difference between what I teach and what others teach. I am not satisfied being raped and being paid 20 bucks or 100 or 1,000 or a million or two million or three million, I was injured. They broke the law. They violated their own procedures. They violated their own set of rules. They do not have the right to sit in that public office committing crimes against you and I. The enforcement is going to come from you and I, bringing claims against them, bringing charges against them. This is what the PAG was designed for. This is what Title 42 was designed for. was for you and I to go back in and start doing accountability on these people. Start holding them accountable. Don't give me restitution. That's part of it. But you committed a crime against me. You assaulted me. You kidnapped me. You detained me. This is a crime. And I read what is constructive fraud. It takes two people. What is criminal fraud? It takes two people. 
there are many different types of fraud that it takes two people. This is what it is the difference between my teaching and those who are out there who are just willing to walk in and say, peace, brother. Here's the flower. See my peace sign? I got my tie-dyed shirt on. I got my long hair. You know, I flip my fingers up like tricky dick and go peace. Just let me out. And I would consider this, you know, the fact that you were beaten, kidnapped, detained, whatever. You were injured. They committed a crime against you. They need to be held accountable. This goes back into the pharmaceutical companies. We talked about this. Is that they turn around and put all this medication out. They get a class action lawsuit. People who have died, who have been injured, they get paid. But the pharmaceutical company still is in business creating the same pill under a new name. Or they may change a few of the ingredients in it, but it's still the same pill, and they're still back out doing it again, injuring thousands of people. And all they get is a little lawsuit. They make hundreds of millions of dollars, and they pay out maybe $20 million. But nobody goes to jail. This is part of what the ITNJ is all about. That's what these guys talked about, the medical side about the ITNJ. It's about the medical side. They're going after natural natural herbs to fix the problem. It's like one gentleman I read in one of the articles coming back in and stating, you have a nail in, a, in your heel. You go to the doctor. The doctor gives you a shot, numbs the foot, gives you a pain pill, sends you home. I didn't say he pulled the nail out. I just said he gave you a shot and gave you pain pills. He didn't fix the problem. Ladies and gentlemen, this is what so much is going on here with our own people is we're not fixing the problem. We're putting a bandage on it. We're putting a numbing agent on it. We're not fixing it. This is what the PAG training is going to be about here at the end of this month through Carl and myself. And if you're interested, you need to get a hold of Carl at private attorney at HughesNet.com. We want to fix the problem, ladies and gentlemen. I'm not interested in putting a bandage on it and allowing these people to keep raping and pillaging and plundering. This is why I got hooked into the ITNJ. Nobody knows how this is going to work until it gets rolling. But ladies and gentlemen, nobody is offering solutions to fix the problem other than myself and the people that I work with. We are offering solutions to fix the problem. Majority of these people out here don't want to fix it. They just want to put a Band-Aid on it. Band-Aids no longer work. We have to start fixing the problem. We have to start addressing the problem. A crime has been committed. Paying restitution is not good enough because if this is the case, then you and I should be able to pay the fine for the court and not do any jail time or not do any probation. Here, let's hear it. Just here, let, let me pay this and let me go. I go out and commit the crime again, and I'll come back and pay you some more money. Matter of fact, here, let me pay you for the next four crimes up front so you don't have to drag me in. Here's the money up front. So now I can go commit my crime, and you can't drag me in because I paid you. It don't work that way, ladies and gentlemen. But yet that's what they try to do to us. If we can get in there, they want to try to pay us off. Very few people out here are trying to fix it. 
we get a lot of criticism. But when I ask the question, okay, then you give me your solution to fix this problem, and they have nothing. Don't criticize me if you don't have an answer to fix it. And I don't mean cover it up, put a Band-Aid on. I mean fix the problem. Keep the rapists from coming back in and raping any more people. Fix the problem. Don't put a bandage on. The people that I'm working with on the ITNJ and people I'm working with here on AIB Radio, we are trying to fix the problem. We're trying to address it, and we're trying to fix it. That's the difference. Will we ever get it fixed? Nobody knows until we try. And if you don't try, you will never know whether you, whether you would have succeeded or not. The issue still comes back to you and I. It takes us to fix the problem. It takes us to address this problem. And that's what we're trying to do. I want to thank you for being in here. Ladies and gentlemen, I walked you through my brief of what has been filed in D.C. This is why this is before more than three judges, because they have got to come back in and show and validate whether a statute can be a corpus delicti especially when it has been declared unconstitutional, and that's how we are being charged. Even if it is constitutional,